All right, let's go back to James, if you will, with me. Then we'll have a word of prayer, and we'll get in our study. Uh, it was kind of interesting. We were talking about it when I came in with those who attend Tuesday night Bible study, just how God is connected uh, two studies all of a sudden together. Uh, that's been kind of interesting to me. I wish I was smart enough to figure that stuff out, but <clears throat> uh, we're in James 5, 1 through 6. I'm really looking at verse 4, but let's read the whole thing. Uh, James fires out, come now, you rich. He's talking, and he's going to explain who he, who he means by this. Weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. He's talking about God putting them under discipline. And we'll talk about that. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. You know what those are symbols of, if you pay attention to the scriptures, uh, treasures on earth. You know, where moth and rust and all that. See, and that's what he's at reference. He's not, it's not literal. It's a symbolic of what, what they were all teaching at that time. Um, on greed. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up for your treasures that you have stored up your treasures. Behold the pay. Now pay attention who's going to scream out. What's going to scream out? The pay of the laborer who mowed the field, which has been withheld from you, cries out against you. It's been withheld by you, has cried out against you, and the outcry of those who did the harvesting have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. Remember, we, we talked about that. That's a special phrase title given to the Lord. Um, host, army or uh, head of the labor force. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. And typical of James... I mean, I'm not one to critical the word of God here, but typical of him. He lays out a really clear definition of what's wrong and then doesn't give us any solution to it. But boy, does he really pound the problem. And he says what's going to happen if it's not corrected. And so we're going to talk about that. And what he's talking about, for, at least for my study tonight, is employment. You know, we talked about the five divine institutions last time. And we're going to look at divine institution number two as we laid them out to you. One, freedom. Two, employment. Three, marriage. Then family. Then nation. Uh, and I laid them out that way because of the way, the order in which they are found in Genesis 1 through 11. And so that's the reason I lay them out that way. I don't know why other people would do it, but that's why I do it. I show you the way, the order in which I see God bring them into exercise in the plan of God. Um, and I want you to, we're going to pay a lot of attention to verse 4, and that is the pay of the laborer. Employment consists of two parts. You have the employer and you have the employee or you have the management side and you have the labor side, and, and this is what described. And uh, the management side is cheating, contractually cheating uh, the laborer, both the one on the front side of the harvest and on the back side. He was cheating them both, the people who were planting the crop, so to speak, and taking care of them. And then the harvest group that came in behind, he was cheating on both ends, both the production and the profit side. He was cheating them. And uh, 
this and, and listen, when James is writing, James is still a citizen of the priest nation of Israel. Agreed? Because that because we're into 45 AD here, and the nation's not going to go out until 70, and he's given a fore, a forewarning of what's going to happen to them if they don't. He says in verse 1, your miseries which are coming upon you. And in context, he's got to be talking about the fifth cycle of divine discipline. In context. I mean, because that's exactly, I, I, I would assume that's what he's talking about because he's talking about the people who are in his day, in his nation, with a serious problem that uh, will bring divine discipline upon the nation. So what we're focused on is uh, that aspect of it as he talks about in verse 4. It is the, it is the sin that we're interested in against divine institution, against employment, which is a divine established. And I hope what I'm going to be able to do with you today is when we go through employment, now I'll probably do a couple, maybe two or three studies on this deal of employment because I think it's really important that we understand it. But, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to establish divine laws of establishment that are really important for you. Whether you're on the management side or on the labor side, there's some things that you need to know that God has set out. If, you, if you're working for pay and in employed, there are certain things you need to know that God has established. And whether your employer cheats you or not, he can't cheat God and get away with it. He could maybe cheat you and get away with it, but he could never cheat God and get away with it. And you always need to know that. But there's some things you should go, know going into employment that God says you need to be smart about it too. And we call them divine laws of establishment. And I'm going to give you, I think it's five. I'm going to give you five laws of establishment today about employment. And, 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 um, these are, and listen, when I talk about this way, the, the divine, for example, employment is f whether you're a believer or an unbeliever. The divine laws of establishment are for you whether you're a believer or an unbeliever. You understand? But they're sure for the believer. <laughs> I mean, we, we should be able to have a heads up going into something. I mean... And so, contractually. So let's have a word of prayer. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. That's 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude type sins or sins of the tongue or revert sins. How do I get out of carnality and back into spirituality of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit? John 14, 16, when he comes in at salvation, he can never leave. You might leave him, he can never leave you. That's been decreed. John 14, 16, decreed it. So how do I get in my life, how do I get out of carnality in my life spiritually as a believer? Back in, uh, how do I get out of carnality and back to spirituality? 1 John 1, 9 tells you, you must confess your sin. That's the sin of carnality. Not, not that I'm carnal, but what is the sin that puts you into carnality? And whatever that sin is, the Holy Spirit's job is to point it out. And your responsibility as a believer priest is confess it. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, that's name it, cite it, or repeat it back to God. He's told you. Now you tell him what he's told you. <laughs> it's a sin. It's a sin based on what the Word of God calls it, not what people call it. And... When you confess it, he forgives you, he cleanses you, and restores you to fellowship with the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You certainly have to have that for Bible study. You have to learn it to live it. You can't live it without learning it. And the job of the responsibility is to, the Holy Spirit is to teach you. Your job is to be teachable. Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth to those of us that have a desire to understand, and we're in the midst of a mess in our nation right now, Father, because 
we have departed from some basic principles of, uh, we talked about it last night on Tuesday night, capitalism and uh, how it should work and how it does work. And uh, tonight we talk about employment. Uh, and over the year and over the period of the next few weeks, we're going to talk about free enterprise and we're going to talk about the entrepreneur. And uh, today we're talking about the laborer and how smart he needs to be uh, and contractually, contractually, as he commits himself like a slave to a master uh, for eight or ten hours or whatever it is a day and how many days of the week. And so it is important, the fact that we have volition and we have the freedom to, to maneuver this way, whether they hire us or not, it's their business. But we need to be smart about what, what, the, what we're getting paid for and what we're doing. And so we make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I think the proof text that James is talking has got to, where he's pulling from has got to be the, the passages dealing with the five cycles of discipline. Five cycles of divine discipline for pre, the priest nation of Israel. They, they could be disciplined all the way to removing them from the land for a specific period of time, like in Babylon, 70 years. And it was really based on their, their uh, resistance to the truth of God's word to their life as a nation. How long they spent in captivity. Uh, the north kingdom went out and won't be back until the second coming. But the south kingdom, they went out uh, under Babylon and out, went out again under Rome. And uh, I, it, it, James is dealing with this is the, just like we deal with our people in, in real time life experiences with the word of God. That's what James is doing. And he sees a real big problem because this nation is all, already under foreign control. who have come in and occupied them, but haven't removed them yet. And they will be removed in 70 AD. They will be removed in such a way the nation will be no more. And so it's kind of unusual. They're, they're, they're occupying a nation. And, um, and listen, Rome was tough. I don't know that they were as brutal as the Assyrians, but I mean, the Assyrians are pretty brutal people. There are a lot of brutal Rude of people out there. Uh, but anyhow. And so, uh, I, I'm, it's, uh, I'm of the opinion that his proof text for what he's going to tell, because he really comes out firing condemnation, doesn't he, to him? He said, boy, we're going to get it to, we're going to get it put to us. So, if you'll go to Leviticus with me for a moment over there, Exodus, Leviticus business. And I picked out Leviticus just because I picked it out. You could do it in Deuteronomy 2, 28, but I picked this one out. out of, um, and I'm looking at chapter 26, verses 18 through 21. You're in the second cycle of divine discipline. Uh, Leviticus 26. And... Uh, I'm beginning with verse 18 because 18 through 21 is the second cycle of divine discipline. And watch what it's directed towards. Now, I picked this up at 18 because I wanted you to, I wanted to pick up in verse 18 how we're coming into the second. The first cycle of divine discipline closes out in verse 18 and opens up the second. That's a system that they're using under divine discipline. So I'm going to read verse 18. If also after these things, that's the first cycle of divine discipline, you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Now, that's going to be a favorite line, and you always watch for that because it's going to kind of, it's kind of, it's going to close out one cycle and introduce another cycle. Then he says in verse 19, here's the second, now we're into the second cycle, 
and it's going to be revved up. The first cycle is going to be revved up seven times as we enter the second cycle. Then you're going to see the second cycle is going to be revved up seven times and uh, all the way until there are no more. Uh, verse 19, I will also break down, now we're in the second cycle, I will break down your pride of power, which was economics, you will see that. I will also make your sky like iron and your earth like bronze. This agricultural, is agricultural, you're not going to be able to plant anything in iron and expect it to grow no matter how much you water it. It's just going to create rust. Like iron and earth like bronze. And your strength shall be spent uselessly trying to do what? Get food. Make your economy work. This is economics. For your land shall not use shield, or yield its produce, and the trees of land shall not yield their fruit. That's economics. That's an that's agricultural economy. If then you act with hostility, if then you act with hostility against me, and are unwilling to obey. And see, this is what James is really pounding on him. We've read that. He, this, he's really pounding them on this. I will increase the plague on you seven times according to your sins. And now we're into another one. Right? See that? This is how this is going to go through five cycles until they're out. That's how we, that's how we learn this. And so in the second cycle, in the second a, a cycle of divine discipline upon the priest nation of Israel, he hits them economically really hard. He hits them with health first. He hits them with health, and then he hits them with economics. And that's just the way it is. And boy, when you study the life of Christ, if you pay attention to what's happening culturally, I mean, the people are sick as a dog, as we say. They got diseases that, pfft. and the only reason they got any kind of economical success is because Rome is propping them. Eh? And Rome is doing that for a lot of reasons, but it's all. But they're doing it because it's geogra geographically good for them to be where they are with troops. We do the same thing, do we not? We, we, we put troops all over the place, and we put them strategically, right? I heard, I heard Trump today talking about putting 1,000 troops in Poland, right? He's put the ships all over the place right now. What's he doing? He's sending signals. And world powers do that. I mean, Russia's been doing it. China's been doing it. America stepped up and went like, look, if you guys think you're bluffing me by doing that stuff, you can quit it right now. I mean, quit it. And so we're doing the same thing. It's, it's, it's playing chess militarily. But everybody, and listen, this is the oldest military game in the world. Everybody did it. Greece did it. Rome did it. They all did it. I mean, if you just study any kind of history like that, you'll see everybody did it. They got in power. That's what they did. And so they're, they're, they've propped this group up. This group up is already under divine discipline. I mean, Christ was telling them that. John the Baptist told them that. They won't listen to anybody. But the only reason they're still in existence, it's kind of like, imagine if we moved away from Israel today. We went, we're done with Israel. Have at it. They wouldn't last a heartbeat. You know, what I mean? militarily, no matter how much firepower they got, it wouldn't last no time. I mean, it's a, you do know that, don't you? If for no other reason, they just drop a big bomb on him and do away with him. Well, okay. Well, I'm just saying militarily. Militarily, they could easily do that. Rome, Rome went in there and sat on top of them. It don't matter who occupies Israel right now. The Israelites that God's interested is all over the world. Right? They're not in one location. They're all over the world. But I'm just saying that the reason Rome is in, is in Israel 
is not because they have an alliance. It's because they walked in there and took it, and they took it strategically, militarily. That's the only reason. I, that's all I'm saying. Okay, for not trying to play God in this thing. <laughs> I was trying to tell you why Rome is in Israel at this time, and God is set, and God has set them up to do away with them. In 70 AD, he's going to he's going to whack them. And James is trying to tell them, everybody tried, Paul tried to tell, everybody that was preaching in that time told them that they, they were going to get it. Tongues came along. T the whole purpose of tongues at Pentecost until 70 AD, the whole purpose of it was to tell the Jew that, that they were going to go under the fifth cycle of divine discipline. <laughs> well, anyhow, but, and so, James, it, I'm of the opinion that James, this is his proof text, and this is what James trying to tell him, because everybody else was. That's my point. Uh, for me, it says, if then you act with hostility against me and are unwilling to obey me, and see that James is all over that concept. In our lesson text, James addresses the sin against divine institution number two that will bring that type of discipline upon Israel. He describes how believers should respond before God brings divine judgment. God always left a remnant, and that remnant had to be really on top of their game. And James is trying to tell them that. John the Baptist tried to tell them. Jesus tried to tell them. Paul, Peter, all the guys tried to tell them. They were not going to hear it. You know, and like all rebellious people, you, you finally get it. One way or the other, you finally get it. Well, this is James' idea uh, in, in his uh, weep and howl for the miseries which are coming upon you. Now, let me talk about, I got three points here before we get out of here tonight about God's instituting employment as a divine institution. I call it number two just because of the order in Genesis. That's the only reason. And listen, here, do not miss this point. Do not miss this point. This, is, this point's bigger than life. He established these divine laws. He divide, he, I'm going to talk about five, four of them, all five were all five of them were established before the fall of Adam. And one's going to change because of the fall of Adam, and the other four won't. I want you to understand that. Because when you're dealing with these divine laws of establishment, they, they, they were established before the fall of Adam. See, when you're reading employment in Genesis 2, 8, and 15, that's before the fall. And that's where you read it. Okay? So I make this point to you. I say God established five divine laws of establishment before the fall of Adam. Four of these laws established still remain. Think about that. Four remain. Only one was changed. It remains but changed. So I'm going to, these are the five laws I want you to see and, and to understand. Here's law number one. We call it a divine law of establishment. These are for believers as well as unbelievers. It's in employment. The first law established was the structure of employment, an economical system, an economical system. It consists of an employer and an employee. Okay? In Genesis 2.8, it says that God planted the garden that's the work area that's what they're going to be employed to do is tend the garden and God's the employer right and the garden of Eden I suppose would be like Disney World today you know, trying to compare, well, what would that be like? I don't know. I mean, you've probably got a better explanation. But I mean, it was way out there. <laughs> I mean, it's quite a place. Genesis 2.8, God planted the garden. 
then he's the employer, and he put the man in it to tend it, to cultivate and tend it, or care for it. He's the employee. See the system? All right, there's your economical system. All right, employment, economics of employment. You got to have an employer, you got to have an employee. That's the first law. Okay? Now, what developed, what God developed and put terms out there, and we'll talk about them as we grow into our series of ideas here free enterprise and the entrepreneur, capitalism. We studied that last night in great detail. Uh, if you. If you, if you don't really have a biblical understanding of capitalism, you should go back and pick that lesson up from last night or from doctrinalstudies.com. It would serve you well to understand this because, you know, I just push on. I, I expect you to stay up to speed. I mean, I'm not going to, can't go over my, Some people attend all the lessons and they're, they're up to speed. And so, you know, if you want to stay up to speed, you're going to have to go back and look at it. If, if it doesn't matter, then it don't matter to me. Uh, so, but you can pick that up on our on our Tuesday night Bible study of Joseph from last night. The second law established, the second divine law established, was the divine chain of command. And it's, these things have not changed. God, this First Corinthians eleven three, God to the Lord, to the employee or the divine institution head to an employee as far as economics. God to the Lord, it goes God then to Lord then to the employer, and then to the employee. That's a chain of command. It's there today. Whether anybody recognizes it or not, it's there. Who should recognize it is you. You should know that. You should know that. And that divine system, and that's true in marriage, it's, this is system works in all divine institutions. All right? The system. Um, once you go to Colossians, just show you how it works in the church age. Paul lays it out in Colossians, in Colossians 3 and Ephesians 6. He talks about employment. Now, I picked up, and, and you should read them both. They deal with it. But I'm picking it up out of Colossians, the third chapter, verse 22. And you've got to pay attention to the word slaves and masters. Today, we would call it employees, employer. The master would be the employer. The slave would be the employee. In verse, um, in verse uh, 22, he opens up. Now, he's talked about divine institution uh, mar marriage in 1819. And in verse 2021, 20, he's talked about family. Now he's talking about employment. And he says, slaves, in all things, obey those who are your masters, your employee. Now, listen, in, when you go to Ephesians 6, 5 through 9, where he talks about this, he's going to tell you that what you obey is your job description. You need to know what, your be, what they expect you to do, how long they expect you to do it, and what you're being paid for, and what your working conditions are going to be, and if there's any benefits, right? I mean, we call it the package. But you need to know that going in. Agreed? You need to know that. You need to obey your masters in their employment contract. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, I just obey them because I mean, there, there has to be a contract. You're obeying those who are your masters. Ephesians really goes into detail. It, the Ephesian part will give you better explanation. On earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, reverencing the Lord. In other words, you do your job as unto the Lord. You say, well, it's pretty hard because my... My, my boss is tough and yada, yada. Look, as long as they don't cross lines contractually, you're working. You serve on the job. You serve the Lord. You give the employer 
what he's paying you to do and you give 100% of it, you, you, give, you do it wholeheartedly, you give him eight hours if that's what he's contracting, you give him good eight hours, you give him the best you got, okay? You, but you listen, you don't do it to please him for that reason, to think that he can promote you or get you someplace. You do it for the Lord who will get you someplace. Look what he did with Joseph in Egypt. I mean, he took him. He took him out of slavery, out of the prison, and made him second in command of all of Egypt. Who could do that? Only God. Then in verse 23 says, Whatever you do, do your work heartedly. That means giving 100%. You give them 100%. Wholeheartedly. G give them. That, you know, I mean, coaches always use that, right? I want 100%. Now they've gone to 100 I want 110%. Well, I'm going to owe you 10 because I can only give you 100. So I'll owe you 10. The coach says, you sure will. So as for the Lord rather than for men, see, he's made that point twice, hasn't he? You've got to remember that when you go to work because apparently it, it can be a bigger problem. You don't know. Why would you leave that grid paying job? I don't like the guy working it. Where the, I, mean, I mean, did he violate the contract you had? No. I just didn't like his attitude. What's his attitude got to do with it? Well, you have to live with him every day. Are you married? <laughs> you think this is the only place you're going to find somebody that, you know, that irritates you? <laughs> don't get married and don't have kids. Uh, don't belong to any church. I mean, you're going to be a hermit, aren't you? Where are you going to find where people don't? Well, anyhow, knowing that from the Lord you will receive, watch this, the reward, the promotions, the accolades. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive. Boy, if you study the life of Joseph, you'll see that everybody bragged on him. He didn't have to go around bragging on himself. He didn't have time. He worked like a dog, and everybody else promoted him and talked him up. <laughs> Nobody wanted to get rid of him. Once they got him, they never wanted him. Somebody had to reach in that had more authority and pull him out. <laughs> Potiphar would have never got rid of him. It was the best thing that ever happened to Potiphar. But his wife got him. I mean, we know who ro ruled that home. And uh, went to jail. The jailer didn't want to give him up. Pharaoh had to reach down and grab him and say, look, he's coming up here. He is. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the rewards of the inheritance. That's who you are. God promotes you out of the inheritance you have in Christ. Isn't that wonderful? You know what they are? Listen to me now. Grace. Your job came to you by grace. You give grace back to God in your job, and job re God will uh, reward you for all the accolades that you will ever need on that job. He will promote be because it's all part of your inheritance in Christ. Isn't that interesting how that little word inheritance jumped into this subject? You should do that every when you go out on mission trips, when when I don't care what you do, you claim it for Christ, you do it for Christ, and, and you're dealing with inheritance and escrow blessings. You remember the colonel talking about escrow blessings? That's what, that's what he's talking about here. And then he says, it is the Lord Christ whom you serve. He said that twice, two or three times. For he who does wrong will receive the, comp the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. And James has really hit this hard. Now, in, verse, in the fourth chapter, verse 1, we're talking about the employer. He says to the master, the employer, grant to your employees justice and fairness, that's contractually, knowing that you too have an employer master in heaven. What is, what is he saying? Do what? What it brings that for? For one. Colossians. In Colossians 4.1. Colossians. 
I, I just jumped to the fourth chapter of verse 1. Yeah. Colossians 4 1. Yep. Say that. And um, w one of the ways you will know going in, if you're dealing with somebody who is fair and equitable with his people, is contra contracts. So you need to be smart about that. The other passage you ought to have on your paper, I don't know if I did I write Ephesians 6, 5 through 9? Uh -uh, you should put it there because it will, it will supplement. And then Genesis 2, 15, the Lord put the man in the garden and commanded him. See, that's a work system. That's a work contract system. Commanded him. He, said, he laid out a plan. He said, this is what I want you to do. In, in verse, in verse um, 15, and then he lays out the plan, the job description in 16 and 17. I mean, Genesis 2.15, he lays out the contract, the work contract. He commands him. When it says he commands him, then he's going to tell you what he commands him, which is contract. He write, it's, it's a work contract in the Garden of Eden. Okay? All right. I just, we're going to get to it. <laughs> Here's the third law established was a job description for the employee. For this, in regard of this subject, it's Adam. He says, here's what you do in the garden. You cultivate it and you keep it. That's Genesis 2.15. That's a, that's a description. That's part of the contract. And here's the other part that's already been established in chapter 1. It's a, it's a six-day work week. You do know that. You say, well, that was Old Testament. It's Luke, Luke 13, 14. I tell you, I guarantee you who knows. If you're an entrepreneur, you know it's a six-day work week. And you know it's a 12-day work day. A 12-hour work day. I'll tell you somebody else that knows it. It's a farmer. <laughs> You'd be lucky to get out of a 12-day work day. And, and listen, the farm we ran ran seven days a week. We'd have been glad to have a day. We usually got a Sunday afternoon small window between the milkings in the morning and night on Sunday unless we had crops that had to be harvested. They came first. Otherwise, we might have a little window in there as a teenager to go swim or do something. It was pretty hard to date between about 1 o'clock and 3.30. 3 <laughs> uh, we, we did manage some of it, but it wasn't easy to find somebody that would date that way. Unless it was a farm girl, it had to be home at the same time. We're spoiled in America. You know what we you know what we would call a, a seventy two hour work week? Two jobs. <laughs> Wouldn't we? We call that two jobs. We've been spoiled by God's grace and, and we're 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 so unthankful and ungrateful for it. It's pitiful. Everybody thinks they deserve a 40-hour work week. You deserve a 72. If you work for God, I do, by the way. They're long days. I love it. I'm called self-employed. Is that that funny? They call me self-employed on my taxes. I used to write in there and go like, I'm God employed, but <laughs> nobody understands that, so I had to quit doing that because they don't mess up the paper. Self-employed. That's a lie from the pit of the devil. <laughs> self-employed. Don't want to be self-employed. I don't even like the idea of it being a minister. I don't ever want to get that idea in my head. Self-employed. <laughs> self -employed. I'll tell you, the farmer knows about a 72-hour week. And I'll tell you, somebody else does. The guy who owns a company. 
I'll tell you somebody else. I'll tell you somebody else. Everybody goes, look at what Saban makes. Look what he made when he first started. He ought to, he ought, he ought to, he ought to kiss the Alabama ring every day and salute God every day. He goes to work because God promoted and Alabama gave him a job. And, and everything worked for everybody. And it hasn't cost Alabama anything. Alabama's made money off this guy. But you know a guy who knows about his 72-hour work week? is Saban. He'd be lucky. To, listen, he and his wife would, would be thankful to have a 72-hour week. They, they make so money, they don't know what to do with it. And they can't do anything with it because they work all the time. Everybody, well, I look at the guys at the head of the company. Yeah, you ought to see the way they work, their work ethics. You ought to take a look at successful coaches on any level. I don't care if it's junior, high school, high school, college. If they're successful, if they're successful, phew. Hmm. Like Ecclesiastes says, as night, their brain is still working at night. They can't even sleep good, Ecclesiastes says because their work day is, sh is shifted into their night's sleep. All X's and O's. Yeah, sure. But listen, God set it up that way. And listen, I'm not, I'm not poo-hooing the fact that we do a 40-hour week. But listen, you need to know why you have 72 hours, why he did it, and I'm going to tell you in a minute. But that's Genesis 2.15 with the third law. And the fourth law est established was the fruit of labor comes from God's grace. The fruit of the labor. I tell you, growing up, I, mean, I don't know how you could farm and not believe in God. When I went up to Pine Mountain, there was one man that farmed, said he didn't believe in God. I used to ride on the back of his trailer, on the back of his tractor, and talk to him about God and farming. I said, how is it possible? Let's suppose you plant this big old field up here. You get no rain this year. You go, what's, this, what's this piece of land worth to you this year? And let's suppose that you don't get any rain next year. What's this piece of land good for? And you don't get it for the next seven years. Ah, nobody's not had rain in seven years. I said, yeah, you ought to study the Bible. You ought to study the Bible. Because we just talked about it last night. Egypt, most powerful nation in the world, went into famine that would have wiped them out as a nation after seven years. Listen, they were already, after two years of the famine, they were dead had it not been for Joseph. Seven years in the second cycle of divine discipline, he puts this upon the land, and it's not going to go away. In fact, listen to me, it's going to get how many times greater? Seven times greater. If it was... Hard and could you couldn't not eat. It was so it was like iron. You couldn't even plant it. And it would do you any good anyhow because it's not going to grow a thing. The fourth law was the fruit of the labor. You understand, boy, when you plant a little garden and you get some fruit from it, you ought to thank God. You wouldn't have got anything if he'd left it alone. It's got to have rain a certain time. We would plant fields, and listen, to have a great crop in corn, of corn, you had to have the right heat in the, in the, the rain. You had to have the right rain in the day and the heat at night to have a, bump, a bumper crop. Yeah, you had to do that. It had to work that way. You could get corn, but you couldn't get that crop. But when those two things work, 
every once in a while God would come over your field and drop a little water down on it, then nothing like water from heaven, buddy. You can water your lawn all day long, and God can come along in five minutes. Your grass goes, thank you, God. This guy's not doing anything for me. It, it's marvelous. It, it, how God has set this system up is just marvelous. The fruit of labor. He says, listen, here it is in Genesis 2.16, this part of the work contract. The fruit of labor is why we work, right? <laughs> the fruit of labor. From any tree of the garden you may freely eat. There's the fruit of your labor. What was he doing in the garden? Cultivate and attend it. Right? He's running Disney World, man. He's, got, he's running the whole garden system. And he says to him, here's the fruit of your labor. You can eat from any tree of the garden you want. You can take as much home as you want. Now listen. They didn't eat to live. Why? They didn't eat to live. They, eat, they ate strictly for pleasure and enjoyment. They didn't eat to live. Why? Because no Adamic sin yet. When he tells them to do this, they're not, uh, they're, not, they're not eating to live because they can't die. I'm in verse 16. Right? This is part of his work contract. Eat freely. You know, you know what freely is? That's grace. Eat freely. Going to cost you anything? No. It's for the labor. You know, they ask Jesus, teach him how to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, our daily. Ain't that interesting? You know what God gives you? Grain. <laughs> the only time he didn't give you grain was manna. The only time he gave you uh Wonder Bread. <laughs> Remember when they used to sell Wonder Bread? I don't know if they still do or not. Do they? God bless. That was it. You could get a pretty good loaf of bread pretty cheap. It was called Wonder Bread. I ate a lot of Wonder Bread and peanut butter. Matthew 6, and in John 6, 31 through 33, you have the manna story. Manna story. Now, here's the fifth law, and this one's important. The fifth law established was a prohibitive is this part of your grievance contract <coughs> on the employer side? The fifth law established was a prohibitive. It's found in verse 17. But in contrast to verse 16, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, see, we're talking about trees in the garden that he's cultivated and tended and took care of, right? I mean, he's got to do this with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he can eat it from all the trees, but you can't do this one. And here, here it is. And if he does, there's a grievance clause. But from the, now, the, from the tree of knowledge you're going to eat, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat, from it you will surely die. Or dying you will die. But he had to cultivate it. He had to tend it. But he couldn't eat from it. Right? But if he ate from that tree, now he could eat from the others. It had nothing to do with living or dying. Come on now. Right? There's no, I mean, if you got a living, then you got a dying. But you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat, dying, you will die. You understand that? All right. It's good to understand that. Here's point number two. Point number two. After the fall of Adam, the fifth law of establishment was moved from employment to theology. Romans, the fifth chapter, 12 through 21. You should read that on your own. Through one man, Adam, Watch these words. Now write these down, and when you go back, study these words. Through one man, Adam, sin entered into the world. 
transgressions of sin, condemnation of that sin, spiritual death spread through that sin, and we were all made sinners. You understand that? It was moved from employment to theology. Uh, made, sinners. made sinners. Sure, you can ask, listen, be, be at liberty to ask. I just wanted to point them out, because you go through here, watch for those big words in there. It's going to, this whole thing, you can see that this thing was moved from employment, right? This thing started in 2.8, two moved to 2.15. When you get to 2.15, you're into contract, 15, 16, 17. I just wanted you to see all of it. Sometimes, you know, you don't get the big picture unless you're really into the passage looking at it good. The fifth law of establishment, the fifth law of establishment was changed because of divine cursement, because of divine discipline to the curse of the ground. The curse of the ground. Now, the ground is the greatest source of God, wasn't it? And when you read the creation story, he's going to put in that ground, he's going to be able to grow all kinds of things, vegetables, fruit trees, everything has been established. Now, this is really important. When man falls, it's moved out of the employment area, it's moved into the theology area, and what God is going to do through Adam's sin is curse the ground. One reason that he's going to curse the ground, and he's going to tell them this, is that from the ground man was made. From the dust of the earth. Remember? Genesis 2, 2 7. And he's going to curse the ground, and he's going to tell them, and he changes a work contract. Watch this now. Let's go to Genesis. Let's slide over to Genesis. Third chapter. Now he comes back to employment. And, and we've got the fifth law is going to be changed. Employment is going to be taken out. For theology to step in, and then there's going to be a change come back to employment later with it. Do you understand that? And, and here we are in 17. From the, tree, the uh, th third chapter, 17. They, now they've eaten, and God is putting discipline down upon him. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat from it. Watch this. Cursed is the ground because of it. Now watch. The, 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 the grievance part of the contract has now been changed. Before it was don't eat. It's the only time he had a don't, don't eat. Now it's been, that whole thing changed. It became the bulk of that has now become theology, and now we're back into the appointment. It's, there's changes made, and the grievance contract is brought back up. Are you with me? Cursed is the ground because of Now watch. Here's how it's going to affect man, and this is how it affects you and I. This is how you're, this is because the curse of Adam has nothing to do with you, has to do with curse of Adam upon employment, i.e. agricultural ground. In toil, here they are, point A. In toil you shall eat from uh, eat of it all the days of your life. Now, did I write the Hebrew word out for you? No. Oh boy. Well, yeah. You can write it. Oh. All right. All right. I, I don't have time tonight, but I'll come back to that next time. But look, in toil, the word for toil. Now, this is really important. Did I did I put three sixteen on your paper? Watch this now. 17 and 16. Watch this now. The same word for toil that's used with a man in labor is the same one in 16 for the woman in travail of childbirth. 
It's his identical same word. It's the same identical word in Hebrew. In toil, the woman has hers from the fall, and the man has his. For the woman is children, for the man it's employment. Are you with me? In toil, here we go, in toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. How many days? All, all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles, in other words, you're going to have complications in the employment business. You're always going to have thorns and thistles in your employment. Where, is it because of you? No. Is it because of him? No. Actually, it, it is. If you left that job and went someplace else, it would be, still be thorns and thistles. There would be hindrances, adversities, conflicts for get, to get the product and growth. Thorns and thistles, it shall grow for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. In other words, it's not going to be easy. It wasn't like the garden. See, Adam had a good deal going, and he ate from the tree, and that deal's done. That contract, a new contract is written, right? Here's how the grievances go. Also perfect environment. It was perfect. It, it was, the, yeah. Yes, the, and, the, the, and the creational garden that he had from Genesis 1 has been changed to what we have today. This is what we've got. Um, Till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, from dust you are and dust you return. That's why the curse on the ground. Man's connection. All right? Man's connection. So it's really important that you see that now what we have in the fifth one um, in employment is the curse of the ground, and, and it really has a five-fold step to it if you look at it. Now, my final point is divine institution number two, employment, was established by God, watch this now, for, si for at least six reasons. Now, there's probably a lot more. I just sat there and wrote the six top off my head that I believe the Bible, like Ecclesiastes and books like that, would encourage you with. For example, work. Established by God, one, is to occupy your time. Right? Boy, I used to hear my grandmother use that little old phrase about the devil's workshop or something. Idle time. I, 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 idle. Idle. And boy, was she right. <laughs> was she right. Uh, one, is to occupy our time. Two, occupy our energy especially when you're young. Listen, boy, when the summertime came and we worked, they, when the sun went down, they didn't have to tell me to go to bed. I, I'd have went to sleep anywhere. You'd have said it's sleep time. I'd have dropped right there. Uh, occupy our time. Occupy our energy. Occupy our intelligence. Our self-productive life to be charitable. And to be thankful to God for his amazing grace plan. At least those six things is why work is beneficial. Ecclesiastes 3.2 uh, 3, says, there's a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted. In other words, run your harvest season and get ready for the next year's harvest season. A time to plant it, harvest it, Disc it down and get ready for the next year. And you run them. You know. I was talking to some of my people up in Michigan recently, and the weather has just, they're late getting on their fields. Uh, the weather and the, such of that. And, boy, out, out west where we call it the, the, the bread basket, they, they may not, they're, they're, they're scrambling to figure out something to do late, for later in the year because they've lost their, their first crop. Uh, so a time, boy, you live off that. We used to live off that a farmer's almanac. My grandfather lived off that deal. Boy, holy. I mean, that was like the holy grail. Listen to this. Here's verse 9. And this is a question you ought to ask yourself. What profit is there to the worker from which he toils? This is the reason I'm doing this study. What's the profit? 
I mean, why do you, why do you, why do you work? Listen to, listen to what uh, Solomon learned and spoke about in the second chapter of Ecclesiastes 22 through 24. What does a man get for all of his labor, for all of his striving, you know, uh, striving after the wind, you know, chasing the wind? with which he labors under the sun because all of his days is painful. The task, the, the work is painful and grievous. Even at night, his mind does not rest. This is vanity. Yet there is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. Man, important to be able to see that. I mean, there are times when you, it's going to keep you awake at night. All right? You shouldn't let it, but how can you help it? You can't shut your mind down. Have you ever had those nights where you just can't shut it down? I've had them. I've had a lot of that recently. Just can't shut it down. I'd get up and, I said, Lord, I, I got to have a little bit of deep sleep. Now, I don't, I don't have to have a lot, but I'm not getting any, and it's 2 o'clock in the morning. And how much time do I need to sit up here and fight this stuff? And, uh, and you know how I'd go back to sleep? You know what it is? Just leave it now. Leave it with the Lord and quit playing with it. What, what, and that's the truth, isn't it? At some point, if you want to go back to deep sleep, you got to go like, Lord, why am I trying to make this? Why, why am I trying to make this that I think I have to be in control of when I know in my heart I'm not, and that's why I can't sleep? So here's what I, I want to do. I'm going to need help because I apparently can't do it right now. So I need help because I need deep sleep. So... I'm going to make an agreement with the Holy Spirit, if you would, with me. I want to put this, I do, honestly, 100% want to put this in the hands of the Lord. I know I'm, I'm stressing over something that's not true. I am not in, I'm not in control of it. I know it in my heart. I think that's what bothers me. I want to surrender it. And you know what? I can go back to bed. I can go back and sleep. And you know what? It helps me the next morning when I have to face some of the decisions that I was thinking about that night and wondering about. It just helps me. Look, 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 you got it. I know you got it. And the next morning, I'm dealing with that same issue, but my attitude has changed about, I know you have it. I am not stressing. I know you got it, Father. I know you have. And I'm not just trying to talk myself out of in the morning, because the Holy Spirit was, when I woke up the next morning, the Holy Spirit just put my heart, we, we got it. Stay, stay with me on this thing. We've got it. Your job is to be a witness for the power of God and watch his amazing grace work in your life. Stop playing with it. You're like a cat with a mouse. And, and, and it, I, I don't know, but that's, to me, when the labor becomes good. <laughs> This is in the same passage where it says, but I couldn't put my mind to sleep. You know, I couldn't get, I couldn't, it wouldn't, I, w I wouldn't shut it off. It's like having a radio and you just cave in and, you, and something comes up and it wakes you up. And you just turn it off. How do you, but how do you do that? For me, it was to come back and, and acknowledge that I'm trying to control something I can't control. I know I can't control. I know I shouldn't control. I want the Holy Spirit to help me surrender this I want to surrender it now I want to go back to sleep I want this thing conquered in my life uh, on the worry part of it and uh, I, I, I personally find that to work listen to listen to how he closed this out he says this also I have seen that it is what watch this now from the hand of God from the hand of God from the hand of God See, and listen, it don't matter what your employment is, whether it's Horton out on the road or me here or you where we are or however you manage your life. 
these five laws are really important and the law that's been changed and a new grievance package put in place, we need to pay as much attention to it. Don't neglect it like Adam did his grievance clause. Are you with me? Because this one, this one we have. Okay. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these that have come our way by the automobile and the internet to be part of our study. We pray this has been helpful for our people, both setting in our congregation here tonight as well as those on the internet. Uh, these are some real truths, Father, for those of us that are employment. And listen, employment's kind of a strange thing because you're still employed even if you don't, quote, have a job because now you have a job managing your retirement. And I find people make a big mistake with that. You're still employed. And you will be all the days of your life. So don't think that this doesn't apply to you. It applies to you kind of like they say with me, you're self-employed. Uh, I am God-employed. And so are those people. Even in a retirement mode, they're managing. They're, they're in an... They're kind of like in both stages, but there's still these things still apply because they're managing uh, economic life. So help us understand these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.